Welcome everyone. You're slowly landing into our panel, NVC and mediation, together with Carrie and Liv, our speakers for today. And we are already 44 people from around the globe here. And uh, I'm guessing that we will have a few more people joining us in the next 10 or 15 minutes. My name is Goni, and I'm part of the NBC Rising team that uh, we are hosting this panel. And uh, I have actually a few more things to say and give some context and share a little bit about why we are doing this. Um, but before I will speak about all these things, Carrie and Liv uh, and I decided uh, just to um, simply introduce ourselves and maybe say a few words about how each of us is arriving now to this uh, space, to this session, within the context also of our panel. Um, so we will we will open a few minutes for that, and then I will tell you what the plan is, um, more or less about for the next two hours. Hmm. Carrie, first. Yeah, please do. So hello everyone. Lots and lots of faces. Um, so I'm Kerry Buckmaster, based in London. UK. Um, how am I right now? Well, um, there's a lot going on in the world at the moment. Like this weekend, kind of in particular, feels very, very acute. The violence that's happening, not only in Israel, Palestine, um, but in many places in the world. And I feel really impacted by that this weekend. I live in London and there are uh, in a place where there is lots of violence amongst youth, kind of lateral violence. And um, there's a lot happening at the moment in, in my neighborhood. So I feel very um, kind of overwhelmed with that and um, impacted and sad, and devastated. Um, and kind of in a way glad that with all of that that's going on, we are here talking about mediation uh, and responding to conflict. At least we are gathering to learn and grow and share together, at least this. Um, so I'm happy to be here. I'm a little bit nervous with this sea of faces um, and, and really looking forward to um, getting into my flow and having a conversation with, with Liv, with Goni and with you all. That's me. I'll pass. Shall I pass to you, Liv? Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm actually wanted to to just name the last part of what you were sharing. The hope I always feel when there is willingness to look at what are the options, what can we actually think about, how to deal with stuff that is going on that is painful, that is hurting people, that is hurting the planet, that is hurting ourselves. All this stuff. How? How can? Well, what can we learn? What? What can we do about it? And to at least have a little door open to that there are other choices than we've done so far. And when it comes to conflict and mediation, uh, I always feel hope that there we have we have this uh, tool of nonviolent communication, mediation, and it can really be of support in so many, so many ways. Um, so I, at this very moment, being invited to speak here, I am um, inviting that hope and that joy of sharing that with all of you. And I really enjoy all the faces. And I encourage everyone that has the possibility to have their screen on. For me, it really helps to just see your faces. <laughs> Thank you. And mm -hmm. I also understand if you don't want to, that's also fine. But I really invite that. That's me, Goni. Yes. Thank you, Liv, and thank you, Kerry. Um, so as I said, my name is Goni. Um, and wow, 
we scheduled this uh, panel a few weeks ago. I, I guess I never imagined I will be uh, hosting this panel uh, with so much loads of feelings um, located in Israel and Palestine. Uh, myself, the last 36 hours have been very, very overwhelming for me. Um, so somehow it's meaningful, uh, especially now to be hosting the panel and to hold the space for all of us to meet together around NVC and mediation and the intention of um, dealing with conflicts or with dilemmas or uh, with the issues that are separating us and are keeping us apart. Um, and together with that, there is a sense of despair that I guess I also uh, experienced in this moment. Um, so I'm here with you and with all of this. And I also want to somehow send prayers for all the people um, that are specifically in, in the land where I am, but you know, every land, everywhere. Um, yeah. Just prayer for life, for people to be able to to live, um, yeah, with safety and freedom. So this is a little bit about me in this moment, and uh, I want to say that together with us are also uh, members of the NVC Rising team. Hannah is here, Shaha is here, Nati is here. We might have another team member that I can't see now. Um, but I also am I'm happy that you are with us and welcoming you. And for all of you who have joined us, I, I want to uh, invite you, if you would like, uh, to rename yourself also with a place on the globe where, where you are located sometimes. It's really nice to see uh, where all of us are uh, located and somehow acknowledge and recognize that we are all here coming together um, to, to be in one conversation. Um, so I welcome you to do that. Um, we will have a two hours panel together with Terry and Liv about NVC and mediations. They have been um, uh, working, teaching, training, mediating, uh, using NVC uh, and different mediation, I guess, tools or ways uh, in their journey. And they will be here with us to, to talk a little bit about it. Uh, we are planning to have the first hour or so for simply a conversation uh, among us. And um, we will have um, around one hour from now, um, a little a little adventure in the breakout rooms. Uh, we will we will have time for uh, you to meet with the other people who are here um, to to share a little bit, and we will talk about a specific invitation later when we will, when we will go to the breakout rooms. And after that, we will come for the last 30 minutes of, of simply uh, time for your questions. Any questions, any question that you would like to bring, to present, to carry and leave um, uh, is, is going to be welcome in the last 30 minutes. And within this next hour, we are um, we will try to pick up oh, and preferably from the chat. Uh, clarification questions. Um, so it's it's questions that are very specifically on something that has been said and was not maybe fully clear. Um, and this is other than, you know, a totally different question on a totally different topic that I'm curious about. So this will have time towards the end of this uh, session. So this is a little bit about how we want to frame our time together. 
Um, and before we actually dive dive into the conversation, I want to just uh, also share with you that uh, this is the first community free event. Uh, we are organizing uh, let's say this year, and uh, we are going to have another two months of different free community events that we will be holding in the next couple of weekends. So I invite you to uh, also join us uh, in the other events that are planned. And um, these two months are also leading to the opening of uh, our 10 months program that is called the Learning Community. It's a program that invites NVC practitioners and lovers to, to learn and practice and somehow live NVC together. Uh, in a community for 10 months online. People come from many different parts of the world and, and both Liv and Carrie are going to be also teaching uh, in the program together with other trainers. And um, yeah, so I guess maybe also Henner, you might also put uh, the link to the, to the program or the schedule some information about that. And for those of you who are curious to hear more, I will be staying after we complete our program today in about one hour and 45 minutes from now. Uh, I will stay, I will be around here if you have questions or you need more information about this, but this is after we are closing. Um, yeah, okay. So one last thing, it's a technical thing for you to know we are recording this. Uh, we are recording this panel, it is recorded and uh, we might want to share it with people who signed up and did not, uh, were not able to attend. Um, so this is for you, for you to know in advance. Um, okay, I think we will, uh, <laughs> we will, we will open uh, our time for the panel, for the conversation and the first thing I would like to invite you, Liv and Kerry, to do is maybe to share a little bit more about yourself and your journey with NBC, your journey as mediators. Um, yeah, just to hear a little bit about you and uh, maybe somehow uh, taking into consideration that a lot of the things that you will be sharing is also very much related to your own personal journey. Um, yeah, as NVC trainers, as, as mediators, as humans in the world. We'd love to hear more about each of you a little bit more. Can I start? Yeah. Yes. Um, I am. So I live in the north of Sweden, uh, just at the Arctic Circle, and I have a lot of time to to ponder about things because I don't have so many people around. And one of the things that I that I had growing up here was a lot of questions around. So what is the, how come people are fighting? How, how come we're not able to figure out how to be together? So for me, that was an early question. And so when I was about, I don't know, around 30, uh, I started reading everything I could around uh, communication and conflict resolution. And I also did a lot of training with Marshall Rosenberg, who was the founder of nonviolent communication and other teachers uh, around, around nonviolent communication, but also around conflict in other ways. So since then, since uh, like 25, 30 years, I have been working, working with this. And I have written a few books uh, on the theme or many books on the theme <laughs> and uh, one of the things I do now is I I I teach mediation but I don't want to just teach mediation because if I just teach it I know that I probably will not kind of realize how hard it can be to be in the mediation chair so I also try to do as much mediation as possible and I do mediation between to parties, like family, the couples. I do mediations in small businesses, in bigger businesses. And I do mediation in between the, the indigenous group here in Scandinavia, the reindeer 
herders, the Sami and the forest companies and the mining companies up here north. Since 2011, we, we started this project and it's a, it's a growing one. Um, and I always humbly go into mediation. No, I always think, what do I actually know about this? Because it really feels like I'm in the place where I was when I started thinking about how come nobody taught me how to you know, communicate when I was a child. I still have that inside. And every time I go, I leave the mediation, I have a sense of, wow, something happened. And I cannot really, really put my finger to exactly what happened. So there is something that is going on that is very tangibly there that can be measured and seen, but there's also stuff that is underneath like hope and trust and empathy that cannot be done, but that can be invited. Um, yeah, that's me for now. Thanks Liv. I was really, really struck by the work that you do with the indigenous people. It's really, really fascinating. Um, so uh, I, it's really, it's a real pleasure to be here with Liv. So Liv, someone I've heard of for many years and I've never met before today. So that's really lovely. Um, and also, I think we we are kind of different generations of MVC trainers. I have never met Marshall. I'm much newer in the um, in the world of MVC. Um, and I have learned MVC from, from different people, not from Marshall. Um, but I guess I wanna also share a little bit about my journey with conflict in that I learned quite a lot about conflict in the family home and learned how to withstand conflict and learned that some behaviors, certain patriarchal behaviors that certain people did. So the males in my family acted in one way and the females in my family acted a different way. So there are rules about who got to be angry, who got to be dominate, to dominate, and who is left to pick up the pieces. And I learned a lot of this in my family home. And I also learned to withstand conflict. Like I could, could face it, I could be in it um, because of certain things that happen in, in the family home. And then I encountered MVC in 2010 and immediately, like many of you maybe kind of felt at home and felt um, a, a complete resonance with it. So I was already on a journey with MVC. Um, and then I met Dominic Barter and Kit Miller in Findhorn in Scotland and learned about restorative circles, um, which really kind of blew me away. Um, in, all, in that restorative circles is a community response to conflict and really foregrounds um, the learning and the practice and the building a system around um, responses to conflict. And um, really super appreciated and learned a lot from um, Dominic Barter and the work around restorative circles. And then I've also learned similarly massive amounts from, from Sarah Payton. And um, there was another stage in my learning because I, I could withstand conflict. And then I realized that there was a certain amount of freeze and dissociation going on, which enabled me to, to withstand conflict. But then I realized there was a bit of a freeze response. So over recent years, I've been kind of diving into trauma responses and stress responses and including my own and how I am impacted as a mediator in mediations, in conflict. So that's been another kind of more recent piece of my learning. Um, and it means that I pay a lot of attention to people who, are, who have gone quiet or who I wonder if they're freezing or who disappear or who are doing all of the work of empathy in a, in a, in a situation whose voice is, is least heard, for example, and allowing space for them um and so then I, I i kept going i'll just say a little bit more and um i had a really significant um collaboration with a few people in the uk network one of whom is here today joe McHale. um and in 2016 we set up the um the conflict transformation weave we called it at the time we still call it that in fact um, to support the MVC community with conflict because there wasn't a structure to do this. So we 
created one. And this was off the back of a bit of history of NBC, the New Futures Plan, which was um, an initiative to reorganize and restructure CNBC. It was stopped. Um, but we continued the work that we were doing because it was a structure that was needed. And we developed um, uh, a series called Building Restorative Systems, which really lent on the work of um, Dominic Barter in that we have MVC as a skill, which is really valuable, but also we need agreements about how to respond to conflict when it happens. And we were engaged in building restorative systems in encouraging both of those skills practice, system building. Um, so that's been a collaboration that's been seven years now. So really happy that Joe's here to um, as part of that. Hey Joe. I'll stop there. That's, I've said a lot. Mm. So thank you, Kerry and Leo. Um, yeah, for giving uh, for opening this window for what you have been doing and how you have been engaging in the past years, um, and how you also started your journeys. Um, and we were thinking uh, to start with um, naming uh, or observing somehow. Uh, we said like three gems that uh, NBC in, is bringing to or could bring to a mediation process, to a process of uh, dealing with conflict. Um, so I want to yeah, offer the space for, for your learnings or your experience around that. Should we take one each? Yes. You want to <laughs> go first? Yeah. All right, I can go first. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that the principle of interdependence is a really important piece that MVC brings to mediation. Um, the, the attempt to be alongside each person in the conflict to make sure that everyone is heard. And I know that many forms of mediation will do this, but I think there's something special about MVC inspired mediation. I think we can kind of embody that accompaniment better than other mediators we because we we are grounded in feelings and needs we can with deeper empathy we can really accompany people um so that they feel heard and the the sense of feeling heard is really important to creating shifts um so i also think that there's kind of um this thing of being alongside everyone who's involved in a conflict and making sure people have enough support, I think is definitely something I've gathered from my practice of nonviolent communication, making, you know, everyone has a need for empathy. Everyone has a need for grief and mourning. So it really helps, has helped me to, um, to be alongside, to be alongside people in a, in quite an embodied way and to create structures to support people. So that's one thing. Yeah, one of my gems is probably also one of the pitfalls, which is uh, always the case, I think. When we like something, we might overdo it. And for me, it's the enormous, the, the, the technology of NVC, the, the ability to connect, to kind of connect through really hard communication, to connect even more when there's judgments and demands because we're able to look behind it or like what to find what is in that judgment and to find that connection and to be able to to help people connect and know what probably would get in the way of connection and what actually can create it and to to really be precise about that it's not like guessing just guessing what might but actually making conscious choices out of the nvc technology and um, that's one of the gems but then sometimes with NBC what I mean with pitfall is that sometimes we just go on with a connection and maybe sometimes we also need to balance that with action and do something and actually not keep on talking but also show show live up to what we talk about so that's what I mean with the pitfall behind that beautiful gem of being able to create connection I throw it over to you again, Kerry. 
thanks taking it back yes <laughs> um i think another another element of mvc is that inherent in mvc the way i see it it is um there is an understanding that we are living in a domination system. Marshall Rosenberg talked about domination systems. So I think inherent in MVC is a relationship to power, is an understanding of power. So I think MVC approaches to mediation that include um, understanding of power and systems that we are embedded in are, have a great contribution towards being alongside people in conflict. Um, the understanding that there are structural inequalities and that people are impacted differently in this situation. So I think when we have a, a, a structural systemic lens with, with MVC, that's really supportive for, for mediation. Because in my experience, like all, all conflicts are about power to some degree. Hmm. I'll throw it back to you, Liv. Thank you. <laughs> I am. Um... So one thing, one one, I have one thing that has helped me a lot through all the work I do, not only mediation, and it's something I I I stole from a, a guy called Frank Ferrelli. He did something called provocative coaching, and he says, "Don't be an expert, be a fool." And whenever I whenever I use NVC as an expert, I I fail. <laughs> so for me. NVC, one of the strengths is that it asks me to be human. It asks me to not be an expert, to be a fool, to be kind of curiously open and sometimes be willing to, to admit my mistakes. Because it's not that I ought to know what the people are going to do to solve this conflict or whatever. No, I'm there as a, another human being, as another as another party in the conflict, maybe not in the middle of it, but at least holding it, co-holding it with with the participants. So for me, it's one of the challenges to to be to be human in every role I have, and not at the same time denying that I do have power as a mediator, but at holding both of those. Um, and I think NVC really allows for that, for having both. Yeah, back to you, Carrie. Thank you. I really love that. Um, don't be an expert, be a fool. Mm -hmm. You can imagine, because it, it does enable us to ask the kind of obvious questions that people aren't actually asking. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I really like that. Um, I guess the third thing that I thought of was, was um, actually NVC itself, because I, I mediate mainly with people who don't know NVC or know you know don't really know much about it um so it's really helpful after we've gone through a process that actually i i kind of share to them that all that i'm doing with you is based on something called nonviolent communication so then i can kind of hand over a community of practice to them and say there are things that you could learn it's clear it's doable and learning mvc can make a huge shift in initial stages of learning so in in the kind of post conflict process moment i think mvc is a is a practice that people can then lean into and learn from so mvc itself i think is a is a is is a conflict resilience practice in itself hmm. live yeah and and what i enjoy also again uh, like you were saying just now that nvc as a tool with the observation with the feeling with the need with the request has those parts that for me is important in the, in the mediation it is what is going on on the outside what is happening what did happen that was difficult for us to face as well as what is going on internally in each one of us how are we affected by it and then coming back to so what can we do on the outside to carry our inner worlds with more care, with more love, with more choices. So that bringing the fullness of NVC into mediation, giving room for all of that, I think it's such a easy way to actually mediate without knowing so much more than that. 
And then we can have fun learning more angles on that or deepenings with that. But just NVC as a tool is actually already there as a mediation tool without knowing much more. I guess we could go on for long, but now we've an we've answered the question, right, Connie? <laughs> yeah, and I so enjoyed this ping pong. Actually, I was, you know, I could just rest here and listen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Gary, okay, do you have uh, anything to add just before we move? No, no, okay. no, I don't have any more gems. <laughs> yeah, okay. Just wanted to make sure. Um, so another question that, uh, yeah, the three of us had, we had uh, this uh, preparation uh, session before this and a lot of uh, emails going on. It's a little bit of terminology uh, question, but I, I am really sure that it's not, not about terminology only. Um, and I want to ask you, how do you define a dialogue and how do you define a mediation process or how do you di differentiate a dialogue from a mediation process or what makes <laughs> a, a mediation a mediation that is other than dialogue? Um, so I would love to, to hear a little bit uh, about this. You want to go first, Carrie? Uh, I think do you fancy going first? You go first. I, I can say a few things on it. Um uh, like I would use a term that would be supportive for the people that I meet. That's my the main the important thing. And for me, when I call something mediation versus when I call something a dialogue, it probably has to do with one, the setting, the context. And the secondly, it it would have it would be like what are the hopes for for this? So sometimes mediation, but of course we have informal mediation where we can just intervene and and it, two people fighting, two friends not finding common ground and able or are able to speak. But for me, mediation when I offer it to people, it's usually I hold it as I'm going to lead, trying to lead the 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 dialogue in the mediation i'm going to try to process that uh, with the participant and hopefully we'll find some next steps hopefully we will from having a dialogue we will find so what do we do after this what how will next week be how will we take this further so but for me the most important thing that because there's no exact what is what and how can I use words that invite people to be willing to be part? I don't know if I'm avoiding your question if I'm answering it, Connie, but mm -hmm. what I'm hearing what I'm hearing that that maybe the first thing to check or to question is really uh, what what word could support you know the um, the possibility of having any kind of conversation? Um, and that people are feeling somehow welcome, they're more safe to engage and be part of it in the in, a, in the difficult situation they're probably facing. So so yeah, so this is the first thing I heard, and I and I guess that also there is uh, maybe with the mediation process somehow the intention to hold a dialogue um, uh, in a certain way or as a leader somehow as a person who is paving. Uh, the road uh, somewhere, <laughs> even if it's not necessarily a solution. Uh, yeah. Okay. Do you do you want to add something about that? Yeah, let's, see, let's see what else is there. Um, I I was reflecting as as Liv was talking that I think I used the word mediation much less than than the word supported conversation or or simply conversation or dialogue process. Uh, and as we were talking a little bit before, sometimes the word mediation has a slight heaviness to it. And I can remember one one situation where the word mediation actually really kind of um, turns people off. And possibly there's a shame response for people like I've got into conflict. I need mediation. And then that kind of um, distances people from the process. So it's exactly as Liv was saying, there's whatever term, whatever word works best and encourages people to dialogue, which might not be the word dialogue, um, you know, use, find the language of the person or the people or the community that 
that works. Um, yeah, I think that's I think that's all I have to say. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We we've been also um, yeah maybe I would like to open the space to talk a little bit about what we call solutions. Uh, uh, in relations to to process uh, dialogue, uh, support the dialogue or mediation, and um, maybe the question around whether as 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 mediators or maybe as people even we are sometimes a little bit attached to the idea of uh, starting a process aiming for a solution. Um, or, or yeah, even in a, in a broader sense, like what are the relate what are the relations between uh, having a conflict and between what we call solutions, and how do you work with that, uh, when when you you are, um, yeah, in a mediation process where, or maybe I I will also bring another another aspect to the to the question, um. Also, how do you relate to a process when it seems that no one has any hope also for any solution at all? So I guess I presented this question from, from both sides. Like, what do you do when there is no hope for, for any solution? And is it that we really attached <laughs> sometimes to having a solution? So maybe if you can say a bit about that. Yeah, and um, and maybe the two th the two things that you've just shared are very linked. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking of of a case when um, people actually didn't want to dialogue. So the solution of a mediation in order to um, deal with the situation, I might I'll share what the situation is in a minute. But they didn't want the solution of a mediation. Mediation in itself is already a solution. It's already a strategy, and they they it felt so pointless that they didn't want to take steps. What's the point? I'm, I don't want to dialogue. Um, and the situation in question was in an organization that had um, a large number of Russians and a large number of Ukrainians working together um, and after the war started last year. Um, so both different groups, although they were working together um, online in, um, getting on with the job mostly um, they didn't want to talk of the impact that the war was having on them and certainly not together um, so I'll just share a little bit about kind of how we proceeded with that it was working separately with both groups and then um, kind of resourcing people so mediation as a solution for conflict is often a very later on stage in a process of supporting people and resourcing people. So, you know, so there is empathy for each person or each party in, in the, the situation. And that kind of resilience building can take months, possibly even years in some cases, but certainly it needs resourcing before we get to the strategy of a, of a, of a mediation in very entrenched and very difficult conflict situations um and just coming back to to this um this uh piece of work last year we did eventually get to a place where uh, both some some ukrainians and some russians came together to talk about the impact of the war that they were having and and each person super appreciated the capacity the, the ability to do that to have this space to talk about it, it was very moving and very touching and it took a very, very long time to get there. And, you know, it's like that didn't change the war, but it changed, but each person that was there was an actor in to some extent in the war. They, they were, they were, they're impacted by the war. So although that didn't change the war, it changed something about their experience. And, and there's kind of ripple, there's something about restoring the trust in dialogue which took months and months to prepare for, but something about restoring the trust to dialogue. And I think if we can restore the trust in dialogue, that's worthwhile. 
I think I've gone way off what the question was, but I'll, <laughs> I'll pause there. No, I actually maybe before Liv, Liv uh, will answer. I actually I actually wanna 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 want to have a follow up question <laughs> around that um, because you're saying um, what we did is restoring the trust in dialogue, right? Like this is the process that people were going through somehow in order to be able to arrive to a stage of, of dialogue. Uh, of mediation and also um you 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 framed it or you named it like we are resourcing people before they even arrive to meet with the other side <laughs> and um i want to ask if you can share a little bit more on on how do you do that and i'm sure every process looks quite different um, but if there are, yeah, so, some things that are um, more collective around these processes that you could share, uh, yeah, what is it that um, can care for these two things? What is what? What are the actions that a, that a mediator could actually do in order to create that safer ground? So. I'll say a few things and I'm sure Liv, Liv can share a few things. Um, first of all, um, listening empathically to build trust. Enough, as many conversations as, you know, is increases the person's resilience and, and capacity a little bit. So empathic listening, again, kind of re reflecting back feelings, ref going to needs. Um, some of the people we spoke with were, were definitely kind of in quite a significant trauma response, having um, left the Ukraine and being relocated. Um, so just support being alongside in um, as many ways as possible. Um, mm. And I think introducing elements of MVC are really supportive to people. So one of the things we did, one of the things I, I did was, was to input MVC as a, as a tool, as a strategy. For naming, for naming impact, for um, expressing oneself. So that was all part of the resourcing. Um, allowing people to tell their stories. First of all, to to us as the the mediators or the facilitators, allowing and, and this is all building trust in us that we can hear the story, that we can kind of um, hold the story and be empathic around it and increase the field of compassion around it so those are just three things but there's a lot more of course Liv do you want to add anything to that yeah because when people when I meet people sometimes they're not you know they're, they're not curious about communication they are they're they don't they're, they're not these kind of people that would come to a training or read a book or but they are curious about their conflict. They are curious about how to move ahead with their dilemma. So what I am trying to resource people with before is all the stuff that Carrie was saying, but it's also like to, to ask themselves and together to check, how can I become curious about the other person's reasons? How can I become curious about the other person's dreams or longings or hopes or, or needs? Like, how can I... And how can I, as a mediator, support them in finding that in them to have that curiosity, to be able to, to kind of stretch and, and ask. So even not guessing feelings and needs, but just asking, how come you did this? I guess there was something in that for you. And to, to, to help them to ask questions without being, you know... I'm going to frame you now with my question, but no, to be really curious about it, to be really curious about one another. Mm -hmm. That's what I would like to add to that. And then to your, the, the original question, the, the, the first part of that question is that, so when I started mediating with nonviolent communication, I was so much not wanting a solution. I just want for connection instead of correction, like Marshall said, he said connection before correction, but I said connection instead of correction. <laughs> connection was like, so then I got kind of allergic to solutions because I saw that people went way, way faster to solutions 
than what they were actually ready for. So they will come to a solution that would not hold like more than a month and then it will collapse because they haven't come to the kind of deeper into what is really there to be solved. Yeah. What is the dilemma that needs to be balanced? They are solving something that is is not what they are there to actually solve. So then, but then I know that the, that that longing for solution, that wanting to have a solution is also kind of a part of the balance because then maybe if I have a sense that, well, we took one next step, then I will find some trust and we are working on it. I will come back next time. I will, even if it wasn't perfect, I at least there was something that happened that made us move. So solution is something like to be handled with with care. And it's such a beautiful thing that we can actually imagine together. What can we do next week that will make us say yes today? I mean, that's quite something <laughs> that we can together think about something that is not even happening at the moment. So to hold that solution part with, I, I almost see it like an extra tool that when I have the NBC connection part and it not taking us anywhere to be able to say, well, now I listen to you guys for like 30 minutes and and I wonder, did you try this solution? Because for me now, listen, it seems like this is the solution that you want to go for. You know, and then I, I'll be an expert. I won't be an expert. I'll be a fool. Can you help me understand well, how come you haven't done that? Because I guess I'm missing something here. So the solution can be also a deeper question into connection. Mm. So it's it's something that I really enjoy that a mediator thinks about. What place does the solution have? And do I have to be in the room when the solution is taken as a mediator? Remembering that maybe the solution will come tomorrow for this couple when they have cooled off and they have reflected on our two hours together. Maybe then they're ready for it. So I don't want to be attached that I, the mediator, will now come and solve it for them like the magic magic person. <laughs> but actually that the solution will find itself also sometimes with, with them. Mm -hmm. So maybe we talk a little bit about connection. Because uh, you already said, Liv, now that in the beginning you were you you wanted to throw solutions <laughs> out of the window and you you just wanted to create connection uh, between the people and I I wonder if we can talk about uh, uh, what the yeah the place I don't know exactly how to ask it in English <laughs> so you might reframe right. the question but like uh, what what role connection <laughs> plays in this process or how do we yeah how do you um carry the importance of of creating connection or coming back to connection when again there is lack of connection or like can how, how do you <laughs> um yeah how, how do you i don't know navigate uh, uh connection uh, within this process so how, how do you see the importance of it yeah so i can say a few things and i'm sure we could speak about this for like a day or two <laughs> yes <laughs> all of us but for me to first acknowledge that it's difficult to 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 trust in connection like if usually when there's a conflict there has been you know, there's trust has broken down. There is not so much empathy. Um, so to to acknowledge that, to acknowledge it silently inside, to know that oh, when I'm not connected to a person, it's kind of scary and and you know it can 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 create all sorts of stuff inside. So I want to acknowledge that. I don't want to push it. I also don't want to avoid it to talk about the disconnection. And then I want to see what is the first thing that needs to be said in order for them to connect. And for me, that connects to the curiosity I talked about before. Like, 
how can I become curious in myself? How come I got so angry at this person? And how to be curious about the other person? How come they got so angry at me? So that kind of interest usually comes when there's a certain kind of despair, but also trust. So it's like a mix of, okay, I've tried everything. I've tried to fight my way through this. So well, let's see if we can connect ourselves through this. If we can find some common ground or something that I know for myself, when someone becomes curious at me, when they really ask about something that I say, I immediately lose some of the like resistance or like when they are curious, I go like, okay, you're curious about me. Then I feel safe. I know there will be a place for me. And then I can be curious about you. I can say much more, but I'm going to end there to give Carrie some space. Yeah. Um, I guess there are different kinds of conflict. And in some, the connection is really longing to be re, re, what's the word? Um, re uh found again that's not the right word but re-established re-established yeah so <laughs> in some kind of groups um that maybe organizations that are working together uh, you know there's a conflict and they really are really longing for that connection to be to be re-established and they need to kind of move through the difficult painful things be heard have acknowledgement and then there's a longing for that re that reconnection and in other situations, and the one I talked about um, in the organization with Ukrainians and Russians, people were, because of the, the severity of the war and the, um, the extremeness of it, people were, you know, didn't want to fight for connection with their former colleagues. It was too, um, they didn't want to reconnect. It They weren't ready yet to reconnect. So I think it really, really depends um on the context and you know connection is is ultimately about connection with ourselves so i might not want the strategy of connecting with this colleague but we can still nurture my self connection about what it's like being in this conflict and um accompanying myself through this which ultimately kind of ripples out so self connection is always um, a place we can go to to support Thank you. Actually, I'm really glad that you brought it up, um, self-connection. And I want to link this with the, yeah, like follow-up or clarification question we have in the chat. Um, do you have uh, suggestions or a tip on how to be curious about the other person, dreams, feelings, needs? Um, but I also want to actually yeah, frame it also in the, Okay, the question about like I leave you you were both linking connection and curiosity together. Um so maybe building on that question, I wonder how on the action level, <laughs> as the people who is leading the conversation, the dialogue, the mediation, how can we how can we somehow open the space for people um to like to connect with themselves and to connect with others or to create this curiosity about themselves, self-connection, or about the other when it's uh, not so alive, you know, because something is there <laughs> between uh, a person and himself or herself or themselves and between the, the two uh, parties. Mm -hmm. Well, I can uh, I can say my take on what I said before, and it's uh, so like I would ask even for in a pre mediation talks, like when I talked one one before, it's like I might listen and then I might also ask them. So, aren't you curious about how come this person did this? What they did, or do you have an idea of how come they? They did so. And I say that just to connect with them. And then you might say, no, I'm not curious. I know why they did it. They did it because they are, you know, they're an asshole. They are just selfish. Uh-huh. 
So then I know <laughs> that that is the stance. So then I know I need to be curious about where does that come from? That they have this enemy image of the other person. It was like, I guess you have, I might ask them, I guess you have a lot of, of experiences of when you haven't had the sense of care around in your, and where both of you counted, where, where your voice was maybe not heard. Is that correct? So I, I listened for where that curiosity was not there because usually we are curious about people that we want to be close to so i i then take the non-curiosity as the clue in where to find it where was that buried under what under what is that curiosity buried so um that is one thing and then i might add you know i am curious about this because i heard this person did this and this or said this and this maybe in the mediation i might say you know i can i be curious about that even if you're not can you know can can i ask a few things so i might show them how curiosity with warmth can look um, and of course i use the empathy skills of feelings and needs but i would do that in it doesn't have to sound like, are you feeling sad because you have a need for support? <laughs> it doesn't have to be any format of NVC, but it's the same kind of interest. What is going on inside of us when that makes us act in certain ways? So that's one, one way I would use that curiosity question. Maybe I'll add something um, kind of slightly different um, about when I might not encourage curiosity um which is kind of you know and this is a, a you know one of the critiques of mvc of being enforced to empathize with your oppressor for example and you know in the case of when there is obvious oppression or harm that has happened i i think curiosity is a tool but not necessarily and certainly not early on curiosity about what led to the the person who 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 acted to cause harm why they did that um so that that's i guess that's one of the pitfalls if you go there too soon um or even go there at all sometimes you don't need to sometimes you can generate curiosity but actually more because curiosity in, in itself is very resourcing when we are harmed when we have been hurt you know, we, we we shrink and we're not in the expansive place of curiosity. So we do want to kind of become more resilient with curiosity, but it could be curiosity about how am I going to re rebuild my life? You know, the it, the curiosity could, could be focused on me if I have received harm. And that's what I would kind of focus on. Yes, can it reconnect it to curiosity, but for myself or for my community or for, for other people who've gone through the similar kinds of thing for me. So... So connecting to curiosity in that way. Thank you, Kerry. And I, I want to move from here to um, like kind of following up on what you, you are just saying, um, maybe presenting situation where is some clear power dynamic or yeah, or a, situa a clear situation that has happened that the, where there was harm created. Um, before going to that, I just want to say we have around uh, 10 minutes for, for our conversation. And I want to mention that because in about 10, 15 minutes, we will we will uh, close this part and we will go to breakout rooms. And therefore, I want to ask participants who do not want to be more, uh, to be an active part in the breakouts, to add two dashes in front of their names so that... Uh, Henner, that is going to allocate you to the different breakout rooms, will know that you are not able to participate. Um, but I will go now to, <laughs> to the question presented uh, or to the next question that I did not present yet. And it's about power, power dynamic and how, um, yeah, how do you uh, relate to the power dynamics that are uh, in the room as mediators, including including the power that you yourself have within the dynamic that is in the room. Um, yeah, and maybe maybe also what 
what NVC has to say about that, <laughs> um, as you see it, you know, as, as you understand it, or as you practice it. Um, go first? Yeah, I, I can do, and I also really want to appreciate everyone's everyone who's here your your willingness to kind of. I know some questions are going in the chat, but kind of like holding off and and kind of you're going to have this time in the breakout rooms to to discuss some of the things that you're that are coming up for you. So I appreciate you kind of, you know, waiting a little bit and we will have space after the breakout rooms. Um, and that has sort of helped me and live well, me certainly just to kind of get in the flow of the conversation without too many things coming in at different from different directions. So. Uh, it's enabled me to kind of, you know, be really present in this conversation. Um, but yeah, what sh there's a lot to share about power. And as I said before, you know, conflict is all about power. And um, uh, and as mediators, we come in with our own power and our own social positioning. Uh, so I come in as a, a white British, um, English as a first language, um, person, for example, able-bodied, I'm bringing all of that into my mediations. Um, and a, a recent mediation I did, the conflict was actually about people's relationship to talking about power. So in a group of people who are working together, um, some were very com comfortable talking about power and others were less comfortable talking about power, um, took observations about power as personal criticism. And um, so part of the conflict was about this. And I could sense that this was what the conflict was about. So I used part of the preparation time that I had with each participant to really normalize talking about power. So I would, I introduced myself aspects of power that I had, aspects of privilege that I had or didn't have, um, including the power of being a mediator and that I'm not neutral, that I can't, I'm embedded in the same power structures as everyone else. And I just want to make that transparent. Um, so it kind of normalized, oh, we're talking about power. For those who were um, less comfortable talking and processing power um, could actually push back to me in the preparation um, rather than pushing that back in the mediation themselves. And we had really good discussions about it. So with one person, they said, after I'd kind of named elements of power and privilege that I had, they said, but why do you want to put yourself in a box? They, 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 they felt, it, they really felt it as labeling and categorizing. So we talked about it and um, got to the place of, well, I see it not as a judgment, but as an observation when I when I name my areas of power and privilege. And we actually got to a place was this person also wants to dismantle power structures. It's just the strategy of talking about it versus not talking about it. They, they weren't comfortable with the strategy of long discussions around power, but they still wanted to dismantle power structures. And for them talking about it in these ways was just reinforcing the same power, power dynamics. So it just gave us opportunity to talk all that through with me before the, the, before the mediation. And, and similarly with those who are more comfortable talking about power, we had the similar kind of preparation. So they relaxed a little bit. They, they, they're, they're being, they felt heard, they felt relaxed, they felt met somehow. So they were more relaxed going into the mediation. And actually we could talk more about the connection rather than a, about our beliefs about what's right and the wrong way to, to proceed in the organization. So um, again, I guess it's all about the preparation. It's all about the kind of quality of preparation and meeting the um, resistances and using the preparation meetings to meet those resistances in people. I'll pass over to you, Liv. What would you want to say about power dynamics in mediations? Yeah, I really enjoy what you shared around creating space to talk about power because from your question, Goni, what place does power have with NVC communities? And I would say it usually is put into the corner. It's like, 
it's shameful to have power and it's it, power is like seen as power over many times so it's a very tender place many times so i'm really happy to hear what you shared about your way of talking about power as such and naming what we see as power uh naming what we how what we can do with it and how we can be open about it and um well so for me for mediation for mediation purposes like when i that is one of the things i prepare myself for when if i know i'm going to mediate a formal mediation i i ask myself so how where's the power in how is the power structure in this place so for example the last mediation i was in there was a boss it was an employee there was another company with an employee and the and the boss and they were having fights um for quite some time and so they're like very complicated uh power structure so it's if it, one of the things i would do is like where do i start who do i turn to first do I turn to someone first or do I open it up for just anyone to speak? And am I misusing my power if I don't direct it to the person that I want to have a voice? Uh, when is it actually good that the person that has least power can have the chance to wait to see if it's safe for them to open up more and have someone else that has more power to speak first? If I know what I'm, that's what I'm doing. So I'm consciously having that in 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 my thinking and i continuously try to update that in the mediation because i might be like i said i might be a fool i might not at all have gotten it first because i have just listened to one and then i heard that and then i listened to another person and i heard that and so i might be misjudging where the power structure is and then it does change hopefully one of the things that hopefully the mediation will do is that it will start having that power to change and give more voices a space so that it will kind of give more well not take away the power from anyone but to expand the power to more to to everyone to more voices so it's a very important and very useful thing to think about and then so we don't want to make it taboo we want to make power something beautiful that we want to look at and then we want to look at it with you know open eyes and see what what needs to be changed around how it's held how how influence and power is held yeah i could say more but i'm going to end there <laughs> i have another follow-up question around that and probably this will be our last question although i wanted to ask many more questions <laughs> but let's see maybe i'll also steal some of the time in the last half an hour um uh, and the question is how are you resourcing yourself in a situation where the power dynamic is very triggering for you uh, as mediators like what do you do there um i've been facing these moments you know <laughs> when there is there's a very clear dynamic or there is power dynamic that um I'm aware of in advance and it's it's triggering for me and yet I'm the person who is holding the process and so how how do you how do you deal with that <laughs> um so it's more like your inner process so and like you mean in the moment in the yeah um I guess in the moment yeah yeah or actually not only if you already know in advance that this is something that is very sensitive for you mm -hmm. I'm, I'm now I'm even thinking maybe you will decide not to be the mediators. <laughs> um, but I, I, yeah, but I, but let's say you are the mediators already and you're there. So um, I wonder if, if there we, we can have an insight to maybe an inner dialogue that you have <laughs> with yourselves. Well, I can share um, something about support, of course. You know, we need support to be able to do mediation. and. Um, I never really want to mediate by myself. I always want to be mediating alongside someone. And as you were speaking, Goni, I was kind of um, remembering a mediation a few years ago, um, which was, um, I, I don't have time to go into it now, but it was very complex and it was around racialized dynamics in a corporate, quite a large cooperative. And um, 
I I noticed I had two people supporting me to do that and a lot of what happens in mediations is in all of the me the emailing and setting up and all of the pre-work there's a lot of navigating that happens before a dialogue and I remembered that that really came home to me I didn't do anything without talking it through with one of my co-facilitators I did nothing I made no decision by myself everything I checked out is this the right thing to do should I be saying this what you know so that kind of brought it home to me how important it is to be taking decisions as as a mediator not on my own and to, to to just check out and run things by other people so I'm only kind of tangentially talking to your your question Goni but um I would also say that in this um, situation, I was triggered. I was triggered by um, the people's responses to the situation. So I did need support to be able to um, act from a from a grounded and more resourced place. So that's a short answer. Yeah, uh, it's a it's a it's a big question, and and I. For me, it also starts before, but it also starts with like, how do I take care of myself? How do I, have I exercised enough? Have I eaten enough? Have I been drinking? Have I been, you know, having empathy from people? Do I have, did I have hugs? Did I have a sense of family? Like, do I come into the mediation with a balanced body budget, as I call it? Like, a, am I, do I have all the resources there on that level? And um, then... I usually can take most things, I, I'd say. And and one of the things, maybe connecting this to the last question, the, the previous question, is also like when I, I remember the last mediation I did, and there was one person, a man who spoke like for a long time, and he spoke loudly, and he spoke like really directively. And I had to interrupt him again and again and again to kind of, to invite more voices. And I, I I didn't want that to become a power struggle between him and me. And at the same time, I wanted to use my power as in the mediator role. I have, I was given the power, but I was given the power from all parties. So I don't want to get into me getting my irritation about this guy doing what he did as the center of this mediation. So for me, I tried to always take another perspective and another perspective like making myself observe how I am acting in a certain way and the mediation will then turn out in a certain way because I act in a certain way so then seeing that this detaching myself actually moments from me leave Larson the mediator but actually just watching it and see wow what is this about, right? Reminding myself, well, what is this about? Well, this is about dialogue. We want to dialogue about all kinds of things. And I want to be able to interrupt when I don't see us reaching that goal. So then I use my power and I also want to use it wisely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm going to stop there. I can say much more, but this is for now. Thank you, Liv and Carrie. Um, I think we're going to close this part. And uh, as I said, uh, we actually planned for a few more questions. Let's see if they will have space later on. And we will now invite you, the people that are listening to us for the past hour, for the last hour, um, to we're inviting you to receive a little space um, to express yourself. And I and I want to. Uh, maybe clarify the invitation and why we were planning to do so. Um, so you are here and you're listening and there is a lot that you are um, uh, hearing and receiving from us. And we we simply would like to give you the chance to um, be, be heard and be seen and share a little bit uh, with other people that are part of this conversation in the breakout rooms. And what we invite you to share about for the next uh, 20 minutes is what is standing out for you um, from this conversation? And what is your, yeah, but this will never work or some sort of resistance that you might have. And um, 
we are not uh, inviting for starting a process uh, uh, that is, is deeper. It's just um, um, to share a little bit and to get to know each other and to create some connection because actually this is a lot of uh, what we are about uh, in NBC Rising. We want to um, create this global movement of practitioners around the world and part of it for us is to have you getting in touch with uh, one another. And after these uh, 20 minutes, it might be even a little bit less than that, we are going to come back here and you will have time to ask questions. So it might even be a space for raising questions that you might have uh, for later on. And we want to suggest that you make sure that each person takes uh, or gets two minutes to express and to share. And then if you have uh, more time, so it can be more open, but we really would like to encourage to have each of the people in the room receiving uh, some space. Um, okay, so I wonder, Henry, if we are ready uh, to have people... Hey, um, yeah, I made all the rooms. Some people uh, keep jumping in and out and all that, but uh, apart from that, it looks good. So we can start 20 so, minutes, is that right? So, Henry, maybe we can do, maybe we can do 16 minutes with a two-minute, uh, what do you say, two-minute uh, notice? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So when so, the time is up, you will have another two minutes, just that you know. Yeah, yeah to, to close, to say goodbye and to come back to us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So okay, let's do then that. I'm going to open the rooms. Will, yeah, we will see uh, everyone quite soon. Mm -hmm. Okay, bye-bye. Enjoy. <coughs> <coughs> Bless you, Hannah. Hannah, maybe you can, uh, after this is done, maybe we could mm -hmm. go back to a regular, uh, I don't know, now we are spotlighted. So maybe we can, uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. Do you want to stop the recording at this point? I wonder. Uh, yeah, maybe I pause it. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, thank you. Hey, everyone who are back. We still have a few seconds until the room will be full with all the people um, that were, were part of the breakout rooms. Yeah, I think that now we are all back here. So welcome back everyone. And this is uh, the time where we open the space for your questions, for Carrie and for Liv. So I would suggest to um, raise your digital hand if you have a question. And we will just uh, try to take a few of your questions. I hope we can attend to all of them, but I cannot I promise that. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I've seen previously some questions in the chat also. And uh, yeah, I encourage those of you who did not get a response yet from me because I was busy uh, to, to raise your hands now and to give space for your questions. So let's start with Nina. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, I had previously in the chat the question if in really tense conflicts it can be an option to first connect with the different parties separately and then leave afterwards ends with that. But how would I, and that now came up in the breakout room, if I'm actually not invited to mediate, but I can actually see that there is mediation needed because otherwise it's going just really, really bad. We just have that situation in the football club of my son. There on Tuesday, we have a meeting with the parents about an incident happening yesterday with one of the parents. And someone has to mediate because otherwise it's just going to be about fighting. So how would I enter this? Would I just contact the two parties first separately? Or do I wait for the day? Mm -hmm. 
I, if I can jump in immediately, I would say yes. If you can talk with people beforehand, listen to them with empathy. It makes a big difference uh, if you have the chance. But then I would make sure that I get to at least try to do it with both parties uh, to, to 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 kind of have them know that you want to hear them and you want the best for them. Uh, and even if you might even in the in the situation you might ask them to wait or you might interrupt them because they communicate in a way that you don't think is supportive and so yes I would listen to them before and also if you don't have a chance I would you know a mediator needs to be bold <laughs> warm and bold and kind of stepping in and saying you know, I know some things that I think maybe can help us here in to handle this dialogue in another way. Are you open for me using them and see where it goes? So you might also present yourself as a, as a choice for them, if you feel. Thank like. you. Thank you. Yeah, that will be a challenge, but I, I think I will try that. <laughs> yeah. Terry, would you like to? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, I I really appreciate um, you. I, I get something from you, Nina, about this real willingness to to you know that something's needed, and uh, I, I it's something that I'm not very good at at doing what Liv has just suggested. It's like I I have some skills which I think could be helpful, or I have I have some strategies. I think that's a very difficult thing to do. I get a sense that you could do it though, Nina. I don't know why, I get a sense um, that you might be do better at doing that than I am. But um, it's, it's the way that you talked about the situation of clarity. Actually, I think I was getting some clarity from you that it's needed. So, mm -hmm. yeah, boldness. And, and I, you know, I really wish you well. And, um, and, and I think Mickey Cashtan calls it facilitated from the sidelines. It's like saying, can I, you know, give me give me this chance give me this 10 minutes or give me this hour and let's see how far we can get in that hour or something like that and yeah maybe maybe to add on i mean at the end of the day i'm also a parent and there is a certain care for my son yeah. and and all the boys actually especially the kids yeah. so this is maybe my motivator to really go and step up yeah. in in that in that moment because you're you're impacted your son is impacted your needs are in this too you are you are a stakeholder in this conflict happening so that exactly yeah you can stand on that actually as a way in yes yeah. i like that yeah, thank you nina thank you both mm. thank you um remy i hope i pronounced your name? Remy. Yes, Remy. Remy. Would love to hear your um, question. Okay. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what my question is. Maybe, Maybe. we can try to help you. <laughs> <laughs> um I guess. I'm in touch with, you know, the thing that resonated that I would like to elaborate a bit more around is the, um, the this reaching this spot where there is curiosity to understand where I am, where I got to where I, uh, I got, or where the other got to where he or she got. And uh, as I'm talking about it right now, I feel... Um, intense emotions in my body, uh, contractions in my belly and plexus and um, narrowing of my throat. And I think maybe it's something around panic. Maybe that's that's one way to describe what I'm actually experiencing emotionally right now. Um, and I'm breathing at the same time, so I'm also observing that. Um, and I'm aware that sometimes in situations where I got to a point where I labeled people like, you know that it's or myself like it's all the situation that it's impossible to do anything and or to get any clarity around what could be done to support one tiny step towards dialogue 
I really got desperate more than once and, and it's really painful. And so I guess the question is, how can I, I guess I have my answer already as I'm asking it, but the question is really, uh, can we breathe together, make, maybe make a few seconds of silence just to, to make space for the grief that sometimes I give up, probably because I believe I'm alone in this and I give up asking for connection with someone else that could support getting to that space where I'm getting curious again, rather than labeling me or blaming me or blaming the other or labeling, labeling the other. So can we take a few seconds to get <laughs> in silence? <laughs> Would be my, my question. Thank you. So you want to take a few moments of silence because you have trust that if we have ta if we take time to to mourn and grieve all the moments when we have given up or haven't found hope in reconnecting, that would give you some energy if we would take that moment. Is that what you're saying, Glenn? It's very close. Thank you, Liz, for taking the time for expressing your curiosity to to understand why I am. I, I feel touched. And um, I think it's not exactly that I, I want to be nourished by the, the silence, or maybe it is something like that. Maybe it is something that I find. I'm, I'm not sure. Actually, it's something around. I guess I'm, I'm, I'm holding on a little hope, which is that I know that there is magic happening in silence more in my life when I'm doing, make, taking silence time with myself and with others, this, this combination of company and a limitness that where resources can come in and just bring clarity eventually. But it's not about control. It's, maybe it's about being full, you know, ligging up trying to be expert and accepting that I don't know and that maybe we all don't know at some level and being open to what's going to emerge in terms of clarity. So I suggest we take uh, 20, 30 seconds at least to just have a moment of silence together and giving space for whatever is there for each one of us. Thank you. I have to say goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Amy. For me, it's um, somehow bringing uh, the question about mourning and celebrating as part of the the dialogue, as part of the mediation process. Wondering if you are including them somehow, often as part of the dialogue and. Yeah, maybe how sometimes, what can be the impact of that? This is a little bit of follow-up on your question, Rami. Uh, you asking me or asking? Me no, no, I'm asking Liv and Kerry. But somehow your question brought it up for me. I would say that silence is a very important part in mediation. Mm. or dialogue or whatever we want to call the conversations we have and to be willing to be with that silence and most often in mediations there are moments where it becomes silent and when the for like early on in the mediation that silence can be so much discomfort it's so like scary and yucky and hard because it's like, I'm not going to say anything because it's part of the game. But then there is this other kind of silence where we come to a place where we start mourning and we start mourning where, that we're not perfect in any way, that we're not able to hear each other out. And so then I would certainly encourage that. I usually don't invite it. I, I in When it happens, I... I want to pause and encourage this because I trust that that's part of the dialogue, that silence is is a spoken space. It's something is said in that silence. So thank you for bringing that in, Remy. It's not only about words. 
I want to say something. I play music and silence is extremely important. Mm. The rest gives you the time to breathe. Mm. So I always use a lot of silence in mediations. Mm. Thank you. I'd like to say something as well. Um, and hi, Remy. I remember you from some MVC camps quite a long time ago. Um, uh, so I, I wanna I wanna be transparent that first of all, when when I heard you ask for silence, I was a little bit um uh unsure. And it was like, oh, that is that's gonna take away the time from other people who might have a question. And um I was a little bit uncomfortable with it. And um and then and then I got it <laughs> more um as I started thinking about um inviting people to be with discomfort because i know that that's an essential part essential skill in conflict if we can be with the discomfort then solutions start coming of themselves and then i um and then i kind of really soften to the request as well for now um, but I, I'm just naming that I did feel a little bit uncomfortable, first of all. And then and then I kind of it took me some time, maybe because I was attached to the strategy of this being question and answer time or, or space for um, for dialogue. Um, and yeah, as as this previous speaker said about silence is such an important part of music. Silence is such a, an important part of dialogue. Um, so I really thank you, Remy, for that. <laughs> For that and I'm just naming and owning I did have a a, a bit of un discomfort first of all and yes the the capacity to sit in the discomfort to stay with the trouble as Donna Haraway puts it to stay with the trouble is something that we really need to do and silence is one way of doing that yeah thank you thank you Karen Karen Liv and I also want to um, invite more hands if you have more questions, and then I will I I will I will wait in silence to see if uh, questions are coming up, and if not, I will uh, <laughs> I will uh, ask a follow up questions uh, around that. Okay, Leanne. Hey, Leanne. Hi, Goni. Hey. <laughs> Happy to see you. Uh, my question is to do with the preparation for a mediation using NVC. I know, Liv, you've you both talked about, you know, having a pre-meeting. What are some of the other things that you can do if you're trying to mediate a conversation or a conflict that can help to prepare the mediation to be successful, specifically with respect to NVC? Thanks. Do you want to go first, Gary? Oh, you go ahead. I'll speak after. Well, uh, preparations, I would go listen to the parties if I can, and then have a moment after having listened to them, like what came up for me? Am I stuck in some enemy images? Am I stuck in some ideas? So I work on myself. I take the time in, in, in the best of worlds when I have the time to really look at what might be my internal thing that might get in the way of the conflict. Um, I might also prepare by imagining, well, where's the power in, how does power come in? And as I'm uh, also very much into shame, I work a lot with workshops on shame. I also usually look at where are things hidden because if they would be open, there would be a lot of shame in there. Uh, what was it that I didn't get to hear or hear fully from the parties and uh, that is probably hidden because that there's shame around that so that's part of me imagining that or maybe hearing clues around uh, that uh, and I do that because I I've learned to recognize how shame often comes out so that's some of the things that I prepare with I mean and then there's yeah a bunch of other things, but that's from. Okay, before you go, can I ask Liv? So when you are um, noticing 
uh, when can potentially shame be involved? You 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 open that uh, in the pre in the yeah you. It, it depends. <laughs> mm. I don't want to open it without having a sense of that they would like me to support them in opening it. But I want to kind of know that it's probably going to influence if there is something that is not being said because of shame it will influence what where we will end up after yeah. the mediation so i might address it once when we are there i might address it if it doesn't come up and i said you know you said this and this and i and i haven't heard that come up now when we're sitting together is there something you want to say around that is like i i might open up for it showing them that i am ready for it even if it's a shameful thing thank you i'll just share um a couple of things um i will try and endeavor to have obviously i, I will always have pre-mediation conversations with everyone who's going to be in the room and i try to cover the exactly the same um free um material with everyone so it's not like i cover something with someone and something else with someone else i try to cover the exact same things with with everyone um so it, it, so for example uh my areas of power and privilege that i hold and a, and a, and a beginning a conversation about power um, I might share about what will happen in the dialogue circle and about encouraging, reflecting back. So, uh, so to to kind of give people an understanding of what's going to happen in the dialogue space, um, and and also kind of like just sometimes, what is a restorative mediation? What is that? What what is it, and what is it not? Sometimes it's really important to have that input so people get a clear that this is not about figuring out who's right and I am not a judge. It depends completely on, on the context. Um, and if I have a good sense of what's, what, what the issues are on, I might input more. I might be more directive in what I input. If I have less sense of what's going on, I will be more open. Um, but I will normally always consider um, include something about how can we support our nervous systems how can we self-regulate and co-regulate in the space i will often include that as well as part of my preparation thank you thank you both Thanks, thank Leanne. you and i think we will have our last question from tom hi tom hello Oh, and I uh, certified together. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, my question for, it has to do with the uh, mediator being warm and bold. And when you have persistent uh, participants that are just in demand energy and you're working on the session, could you share an example that you've either intervened with um, boldness that shifted the energy? And or that how if they close the session, do you offer suggested action steps getting ready for the next session? So what do you do with the persistent demand energy and some strategies that have, you've noticed? And has that ever not worked before? Okay. Great question. Mm -hmm. A rich one. Mm -hmm. um, I can start with the end. And it meaning, yes, I very often want to, like when I, when, if I have two hours with someone or with people, with a group or so, I want to at least use the, the later part of it to talk about. So what, what are the next steps? So maybe we have 15 minutes at the end who we would say, so I want to know what, what are we taking with us and what are we actually going to change or try or do differently or I want to have them uh, talk about that and maybe they don't come down with something that everyone says yes to but I want at least to 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 mention that uh, and I leave the demands thing the demand question to you Sherry if you want to answer it thanks 
<laughs> I, or I can answer that too, but. <laughs> um, uh, I, I say thanks like that in kind of a nervous way because it is something that I find difficult to deal with because it triggers me. It triggers me when someone is in uh, demand energy, maybe about the mediation or, you know, about, you know, my role in it or in relation to other people in the mediation, if they're in a kind of dominating or demand energy. So I might name that, might name that transparently, some cares or concerns I have about that, might name things that I'm noticing. Uh, and I might use my power to do that, you know, so I can just name things kind of quite directly, maybe outside of the space separately, or sometimes inside the space if it's happening repeatedly. But definitely, if something is happening, I will need to name it and acknowledge it if it's something that you could see that it's this is part of the problem. So we, I would need to intervene into that. And I'll, I'll, I'll just pause and see if Liv, there's something else you want to say. I know we're coming towards the end now. Yeah, and and maybe I will sound a bit airy fairy with trying trying to make like a quick. Uh, tour back to the source of this person's demand it's like when people have demand energy i i personally find that more easy than when the people are kind of hopelessly given up when they have no demands anymore <laughs> they have kind of so demands for me it's just like a person is saying i need help and i don't know what it is but i'm going to demand it of you because i'm desperate so to me, I it actually helps me knowing that this person is on kind of burning. They are they are really wanting something to change, and if I can tap into that, and I don't say I can do that every day, but if if I can, I can just hear that and I can rec recognize that in myself when I'm desperately desperately not having what I need, and I want that from someone. And then I can be with them and I can, say, I can hear that it's really, really super overwhelming. And I wonder if you can wait a bit with that or if you can tell me what I can do right now for you to sit with that because we're not going to be able to deal with all of that in this very moment. So I want to not have in, putting it back, don't have demands. No, I want to have demands until it's transformed into something that is more open where er everyone else's voices also counts appreciate both of you and i said it's a combination of the expert and the fool mm -hmm. quote, quote, you know, in your <laughs> answers also i enjoy it. deep gratitude for your time that you've offered today thank you thank you tom thank you tom for your question and yes we are coming to to an end it's the time for us to close and um I would like to thank you, Harry and Liv, uh, for being here with us and for saying yes <laughs> to our invitation. Both Liv and Kerry were teaching um, some sort of mediation classes um, in our previous learning community. And this is where I got to really enjoy and get inspired from your teachings. And this is why we, we invited you also to to share it with uh, a, a bigger um yeah a bigger a wider community of people. So I'm I'm really grateful for that. And um, more practically, as I said before, if the people who are around here would like to hear more about our next learning community, I'm going to be around here for a few minutes and answer questions and give more information and also just really want to welcome people um, to learn more with you, Carrie and Liv. Both of you are offering different uh, trainings um, and I encourage people and welcome people to check them out. Um, as I was very, very inspired when I uh, was learning with you. So I would really, really encourage people to also do that if they are curious to learn more with each of you. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's been a wonderful evening. Thanks, everyone. Very rich 